Matthew chapter 18, and uh, as you turn to Matthew 18, if you're still turning, ask yourself this question. Who in your life right now is the hardest person to forgive? Who do you, who do you wrestle with, struggle with maybe, forgiveness in your life? Uh, we've been doing a series on forgiveness. We spent the first three weeks primarily looking at how God forgives us, how we can receive and enjoy and remember that forgiveness. And then the last week that we were together, we made a turn to look more at how we apply that forgiveness at the horizontal level, how we forgive others when they offend us. And in some sense, we're going to pick up thematically almost exactly where we left off last week. Jesus taught on forgiveness more than once, a very important topic. And so I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we'll go back and make comments on it. Matthew chapter 18, and start in verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused, and he went and he put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and they reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, it's a pretty sobering passage, and I want us to think today about the theme of repeat forgiveness. And the first point, we could talk about, well, what about repeat offenders? And we have to have persevering forgiveness. Okay. Now, uh, you, you may look at this passage, and Peter thinks he's doing a good job here. Because some of the rabbis at that time would teach that even God would only forgive his enemies three times. And they got that from a passage in Amos and I think they misunderstood it, misapplied it. So Peter, though, he felt like he was one-upping all the rabbis of his day to say, Hey, Jesus, I understand forgiveness is a big deal, but what if somebody keeps doing the same thing over and over? Seven times, would that be enough? Thinking he's going to get a gold star for that. He gets a rebuke. And Jesus says, no, 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 not seven times, seven times 70. Now, obviously, Jesus is not saying 490 times is the mark. And you just keep track, Peter, and your little ancient scroll, one, two, three. And when you get to 491, you can just blast that person with venom and revenge. It's not what he's saying. Number one, if you're keeping track that long, you, you probably have some other problems going on. Now, part of you may pause and say, is this a little unrealistic. I mean, who, who would experience the same person sinning against you in the exact same way 490 times? Well, marriage, maybe, hypothetically, maybe parenting with children, maybe any kind of small community, small family that you're in where you interact with the same people. Now, the idea is we should be willing, we should be even desirous, I think we could say, to persevere in forgiveness. We should have no plans to stop forgiving. God has no plans to stop forgiving us. Aren't you glad? Genuine forgiveness knows no no boundaries as far as time and repeat offenses. There's a great commentator named R.T. France on Matthew, and he says this, if one is still counting, one is not forgiving. Right? 1 Corinthians 13, love keeps no record of wrongs. Not saying that you literally don't know about it, but you're not keeping track. There's a gracious, there's a generous spirit. 
when somebody perseveres in sinning against us, we need to persevere in forgiving. Okay, what about the repeat offender? Keep forgiving. Now, the next question we could ask is this. What if a Christian, a so-called Christian, in air quotes, never forgives? If this is a type of persevering sin. And we mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but I want to come back and double-click on it. This first servant who was forgiven such a great debt by the master, why did he turn and when a fellow servant who had a much smaller debt to him, why was he unwilling to forgive? We don't know for 100% sure. But I think we can gander a guess. And here's the best guess. At some level, he's suspicious that the master's forgiveness really wasn't as full and free as the master made it sound to be, right? Again, this ought to remind us somewhat of Joseph's brothers. It seems too good to be true, and maybe that's because it is too good to be true. So I better go ahead and collect my debt from my fellow servant because it's highly likely the master's going to come back around and make me pay one day. Suspicion about the father's forgiveness for you, for me, will make it much harder to forgive others. Now, maybe it's not that, okay? At minimum is this. There's not enough shock and awe and delight and wonder at the goodness of the Father's mercy. Because if there was, in a sense, it would be natural that it would overflow. Okay? Now, this is so important. Okay? I, I said this last week, but I'll say it again. John MacArthur said... There is nothing more godlike that a human being can do than to forgive. And I think that's really true. And if that's true, then I think the corollary must be true as well. There's nothing more satanic that a human being can do than to refuse to forgive. Now, in the short run, what if someone sins against you and you have a really hard time forgiving that person? And you don't do it instantaneously. That doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Right? Sanctification takes time. A few weeks ago, we looked at King David, who was the man after God's own heart. He was the gold standard of the Old Testament. He was definitely a real, regenerate, growing believer. But he had a season where he was backslidden in his sin for at least nine months, hard-hearted in his sin. Have you ever thought about this question? How long can a real Christian stay backslidden and hard-hearted in their sin? Don't do an experiment and try to figure it out. But we know it can at least be nine months. Now, it's not worth it. Don't do it. Whatever your sin is, small or big in your eyes, be quick to confess, be quick to repent. But the sin of unforgiveness, it could go on and on for a while. But part of what this parable is pointing us to is this. If you never repent of that sin, if you're never finally willing to forgive others, that's proof, that's evidence. You're not a genuine believer. James chapter 2, verse 14, how can you have faith if you don't ever have any deeds? True, genuine, saving faith. We're saved by faith alone, but that faith never stays alone. It turns into a changed life. The Reformation Study Bible says this, an unforgiving heart is an unforgiven heart. Uh, Keep your finger here. We'll be coming right back, but flip over to Hebrews chapter 10 really quick. Hebrews chapter 10. And while you turn there, I'll share this quote with you. Reverend Barker, Frank Barker, who planted Briarwood Presbyterian Church, he had a phrase that he used to love to say that's been very helpful to me. Faith that fizzles before the finish was false from the first. Got it? Okay. It's like a tongue twister. Try to say it seven times really fast and you'll mess it up. But it's somewhat easy to remember. Listen, the question is never, did I have genuine saving faith and then did I lose it? If you have genuine saving faith, you can't lose it. The question is, do we genuinely have saving faith? 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 says this. They went out from us, meaning they left the church, they left the body of believers, because they were never really of us. Remember Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus is talking about his return, and some people say, Lord, Lord, didn't we know you? And in your name do many good works. He didn't say, I used to knew you, 
and now I don't know you anymore. He left. He said, I never knew you. It was never real. It was always fake. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 for just a second. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Guys, the Bible has a lot of wonderful truths that are delightful to read. I mean, they're enjoyable, they're fun, they're sweet. <laughs> the Bible also has some very, very sobering, heavy passages. And we can't just pick and choose. And this parable that we're looking at, it has both. It's very sobering. It's very sweet. And I want us to take it in fully as best we can. Matthew Henry says this. Those who don't forgive their brother's trespasses did never truly repent of their own. And therefore, that which is taken away is only what they seemed to have. So, here's the bottom line of this second point is this. And you can apply it much more broadly than just unforgiveness. If there is any sin in my life or your life that we say, I know that sin and I don't care. I'm not repenting. I'm hanging on to this one. It's my favorite. I'm addicted to it. It's my pet sin. Or I'm just too used to it. It's too hard. I refuse to repent. That's not the sign of a forgiven heart. Does that make sense? I'm not saying you can't be there for a moment. <laughs> but if you persevere in that for a lifetime, that's evidence that you've never genuinely been changed. Satan wants, I think more than anything, to drive a wedge between God and his people. But think about this. Satan doesn't know. He, he's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Think about Judas and Peter. Both following Jesus around. Both soaking in Jesus' teaching. Both going out doing ministry. And Satan evidently went after both of them to sift them. And Judas fell all the way away and never returned because he wasn't real. He never was real. Peter stumbled badly. But Peter returned. I'm going to stumble badly. I have stumbled badly. If you're in Christ, you'll stumble badly still. But let's be like Peter. When we're convicted, let's be quick to repent. Let's be quick to come back so that we can be restored by the grace of God. Now, the third point. There's persevering mercy. Right? There's persevering mercy. But here's the question I want us to ask as we look at this point. What about forgiving a monster? And I'll explain what I mean in just a second. Because when we talk about maybe small issues... I was teaching on this one time, something similar, and I used an illustration that when our kids were young, uh, in, our in our house that we live in, we have, a, I think it's called a Jack and Jill master bathroom where you have two sinks, right? Dad's sink, mom's sink, and my wife, she would always cut our three boys' hair. Now, for the most part, I was very grateful. That saved money. Uh, that saved time. I didn't have to take them to the barber shop. Okay? I didn't have to do it. There were a lot of things I was thankful. The only thing I didn't like about it is my wife would always choose to cut the boy's hair over my sink. And it would be such a long, tedious process trying to do all three at the same time, and they didn't always sit very still. There just never seemed to be enough time to clean up. And I'd get home, and my sink is just full of all this blonde hair. Now, I'm such a great, godly saint that I just overlooked it. I just forgave it time and time again. Now, eventually I had to say something. But here's the thing. All of us probably have stories of little offenses like that, right? Small offenses. And, and we talk about forgiveness. It's like, yeah, when we're talking about somebody cutting their hair over your sink and you have to clean it up, it's 
great. What do you want, a forgiveness merit badge for that? But you live life long enough and you're going to bump up against things that are a lot worse than just little nicks and bruises, right? And, and the key to really understanding this parable comes down to understanding the difference in the two amounts of money that, that one servant owned to the master that the fellow servant owed to the other servant. Because imagine if you're in a marriage where your spouse was a repeat offender, they were a serial adulterer. Or imagine you've got an adult child who's married to somebody that's verbally abusive. Or I could go on and on. I mean, you live long enough in this life, and there's going to be really horrible, painful offenses that aren't so easy to just overlook. Okay? Now, the idea is this. Three months' wages, 100 denarii, we can get a pretty good idea. It was several months' wages was what the one servant owed the other servant. A significant sum. I mean, just imagine if next year you get ready to pay your taxes and you're like, hey, your accountant last year made some mistake, and you're going to owe about six months' wages on your taxes. Like, this is going to hurt. Might have to get a loan for this one. But you can get it done if you have to. It's a lot, significant, but it's possible. 10,000 talents. 10,000, that number was the largest number they had in Greek. And the talent was the largest sum of money they had. It's hard for us to get our minds around it. I mean, it would have been modern-day equivalent, billions of dollars. And really a better illustration, it would be like a couple of kids playing on the playground. Who's the richest man in the world? I think it's Jeff Bezos. Right, maybe before the divorce, okay? And he has like a zillion trillion dollars. It's just like a made-up number. That's essentially what this parable is doing. One servant owed the other servant a significant sum, but it's tangible. You can get your mind around. What did the other servant owe to the master? Zillion trillion. So when he fell down saying, I promise I'll repay you, it was a lie. It was delusional because it was impossible. You could never repay it. And the master just looked on him and had mercy. Okay? Now, have any of you ever been in a situation where, and again, I'm going to tell this from a marriage, family, parenting situation. And unfortunately, I have been in this situation where maybe you have told a small white lie to your spouse. Or maybe you got sinfully angry at your spouse and raised your voice in some harshness. Some, you, you clearly sinned against your spouse. But then you confessed, and your spouse was merciful. And within the next few minutes, maybe hours, one of your children did the exact same thing. Does it not soften your heart a little bit? It ought to. I just told a lie to my wife. She busted me. I confess, she was gracious. And now I catch my son in a lie. It's pretty hard to be self-righteous right then. I'm not saying it's impossible. But there's a sense of, hey, buddy, I get it. I don't like that you lied to me. You don't need to lie to daddy. But you know what? Dad's told a lie before in his life. Dad told a lie yesterday. It's easier to be merciful. There ought to be a sense when we're walking with God and we're experiencing his mercy on a repeat basis that it becomes easy, it becomes more natural for us to forgive those that sin against us. I mean, one of the reasons that good worship services have a confession of sin and then a reminder of God's pardon is we need that. We need that on a daily basis. We certainly need it on a weekly basis at minimum. That we go on sinning against our Father in heaven, but he continues in showing mercy. Years ago, I was studying this passage to teach it in a, in a kind of a different context, different place and time. And as I was studying, literally the week I was studying this passage, a friend of mine told me a story of somebody that he knew. He didn't know I was studying this passage. He said, man, I just heard this story. It's horrific. I want to tell you about it. And the story was this, 
that he knew a family, professing believers, very involved in the church, where it had come out that the husband had been sexually molesting the children and had been arrested. And as he's telling me this story, he said, the reason I know is I just ran into the woman and she's actually going to visit her husband in prison. Do you ever have those situations where it's just like your mind just can't compute? You just, it's like it almost starts to overheat, shut down, you just can't. And I'm literally sitting there thinking, why, why go visit? What would you say? How could you even look at it? And it's like the Holy Spirit started to bring this passage to my memory. Guys, here's here's the key to understanding and applying this parable. We have to always see our sin against Father God in heaven as worse than any sin that could ever be done against us. That is not the way that most of us think in modern Western culture. We tend to think of our sins against God as little white-collar domesticated sins. Not that big of a deal. I raised my voice once in anger. I got a little harsh. I was a little selfish. Maybe I was a little greedy. We like to give ourselves a pass. Matthew Henry said this, there is no such thing as a little sin because there's no such thing as a little God to sin against. See, for Christians especially, we should think of sin less and less like a speeding ticket where we sinned against the state. The state, what is that? So impersonal, who cares? And we should think of it much more as a relational thing. I sinned against my best friend. I sinned against my spouse. I sinned against the lover of my soul. And that can make the smallest sins so great. And then we tend to take personal offenses so serious because we take ourselves way too serious. Whereas we ought to be taking God Supremely serious. A sin against him, terrible. A sin against me, not that big of a deal. (laughs) Because who am I? I'm nobody. I'm not that important. And there ought to be this right and proper sense of shock and awe. I can't believe the master was so generous, so filled with compassion to forgive me. If this person keeps sinning against me over and over, but they keep trying to repent... But it's just like they're just having a really hard time. I can keep showing mercy because I'm overflowing with a wealth of compassion that flows down to me from heaven. Amen. Now, the ESV, I love the ESV, but the ESV actually, if you look at verse 34, it softens a very important word here. Okay? And it's the word jailer. And literally, and some of you may have a footnote. Verse 34, word jailer in the ESV. If you look down your footnote, literally, it's torturers. Listen, guys, some people will try to soften this whole passage. Well, God is just, God the Master is just disciplining, chastising the one servant for not forgiving. That's not what it's talking about. This is talking about somebody that perseveres in an unforgiving heart, suffering the torture of hell. Now, how many of you saw the movie uh, The Passion of the Christ? came out about 20 years ago. I think I was living in Florence. I think I literally saw it in this theater when it came out. And there's a scene after Peter chops off the guy's ear. I don't know if you remember this. It's kind of a small, minor scene, but it, it, to me, may have been part of the best part of the movie. And Jesus gets down on his knees beside this guard that wanted to arrest him and torture him. And he heals his ear. He puts it back on. And then the soldiers arrest Jesus. They're dragging him away, kind of beating him as they go. The disciples scatter, fearful, into the night. 
And for just a second, the camera is focused on this guard on his knees, kind of like touching his ear. And he just has this face, this flabbergasted face, shock and awe. I can't believe I got my ear chopped off. And it's not like they had modern surgery back then. I just take this down to the hospital. It's be easy to sew back on. And the man I was arresting was gracious enough to heal me instantly. Guys, for Christians, there ought to be that similar sense of I'm flabbergasted every day I wake up and God has chosen to have mercy on me again. It's, there ought to be this sweet sense of relief. It's glorious. And for me personally, I know when it comes home the most is when I'm freshly aware of my sin. Ask yourself this question. When is the last time, in a fresh way, you had a sense, I ought to be in hell right now. I've deserved it a thousand times over. I've merited it. And yet, here I am alive in 21st century America. I got a few bumps and bruises, but by and large, I'm doing really well. And that's not because of my ingenuity. It's not because of my hard work. It's because of the rich, generous, lavish mercy and compassion of my Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, when that is bubbling over, flowing inside of your heart, worship and praise, and then somebody offends you, slights you, ruins your reputation, whatever, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. I'm saying it ought to be more easy. It ought to be more, more natural to say, I forgive you. I forgive you. I was part of that. I can pardon others. Hendrickson said, we should yearn to forgive. The Heidelberg Catechism says, it is our sincere intention heartily to forgive our neighbor. Last thoughts, guys. Why am I not in hell? Why are God's people not suffering the wrath that we deserve? <laughs> because Christ was given over to the torturers for us. He took our place. I don't know about you, but thinking about the sinless, stainless, spotless Son of God becoming my Savior by will be being willing and not just being willing, but actually going there to suffer for my sins. It humbles me, but it also gladdens me. And guys, it ought to empower us that when we are sinned against, we can forgive. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you, we worship you, we honor you, we love you. We don't love you as much as we ought to love you, but we want to grow in that love. We want to grow in our appreciation for who you are, for what you have done, for what you are continuing to do, for how you love us every day, that your mercies are new every morning. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would be conforming us to your image and specifically that more and more we could be like you so that our mercies towards others could be new and fresh every day as well. We pray all this in Christ's name.